Welcome to the Herbal Hour. I'm your host, Stephen Horn, and today we're going to talk about blood tests, and specifically we're going to talk about how to use blood tests to determine your metabolic type. With me to talk about this subject is Kimberly Ballas, a naturopathic doctor, um, someone who has experience and knowledge in this field of metabolic typing and reading blood tests, and thank you for being with us today um, to share your knowledge and information. Uh, let me give a little introduction to this. Um, our blood is uh, part of the biological terrain. That's the internal environment of the body. And we use a little model at the Tree of Life Institute that helps understand what we mean by this. It's called the disease tree. And you may have seen this uh, on some of our other videos. Disease has certain root causes that all feed into the biological terrain, which is the fluids that bathe and irrigate all the cells of our body. And so when we look at something like blood, we're looking at that trunk of this disease tree, the biological terrain, which helps us not only see what's underneath some of the various diseases or symptoms that a person may, has, may have, it also helps us get closer to evaluating what we can do to make changes in the root cause, such as um, putting people on a better nutritional program for their body. So we're going to talk about how uh, our blood tests can help determine our metabolic type. And so I guess the first question is, Kim, what is metabolic type? <laughs> <laughs> metabolic typing are the norms that were established by Dr. Kelly, and we take the numbers that are printed out on blood reports, and that helps us determine whether we have a parasympathetic dominant or a sympathetic dominant nervous system. And the information that reveals to us helps us understand why people are more acidic and some people actually appear more alkaline and which food choices and which supplement choices help bring them back to balance because being dominant parasympathetic tends to be like that opposite reaction people think that you have when something like valerian actually makes you hyper. It doesn't, it's just valerian doing the same thing it always does is a sympathetic nervine of helping calm the sympathetic where the dominant parasympathetics already are out of balance, so it tends to hyper excite them a little bit. So we're gonna discuss each of the blood tests involved and what nutritional profiles and supplement profiles come out of those So types. one of the things we're saying here is that, that not every nutritional, that, is, that there's no optimal nutritional program that's gonna work for everybody. We're all a little bit different. We're gonna break it down into seven types, and this is a good general basis to start with this. You basically determine your metabolic type from your blood work and then you can further tweak that or personalize or individual it, individualize it by your blood type um, by applying zone diet information from Barry Sears. From um, this, this part helps to establish your acid and alkaline levels. Okay. Well, let's, maybe we should talk a little bit about what metabolism is so people understand a little bit more of the concept of uh, of the metabolic type. Okay, um, a lot of times when we hear the word metabolism, we think of diet, or we think of, oh, well, my metabolism's not running efficiently, so I'm not burning off the food that I'm eating. And just step outside of that realm right now because that's not really the whole aspect of metabolism that we're gonna discuss. We wanna discuss anabolism. Anabolism is where the body takes these simple substances and it builds them to form more complex. So it takes like a single molecule and keeps adding to that until you have like a long chain strand of some the sugars, the proteins, things like that. So it builds tissue growth. That's like that repair mode. When you need to have repair, your body tends to go into a more of an anabolic state to rebuild. Okay. Then you have catabolic. Okay. Catabolic is the body breaking things down, just like you know, you eat something and the enzymes start to work and the digestive system breaks it down. That's a catabolic response. So with catabolic, it's cleaning. It flushes the excess toxic residue out and it's moving things along in the body. So it actually tends to break down. Okay, so does that have some relationship to the nervous system? Okay, well, th that is your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. Oh, you mean so the sympathetic and parasympathetic help control the anabolic and catabolic processes in the body. Sympathetic controls your anabolic and parasympathetic controls your catabolic. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So how, how do we tell the difference with the sympathetic and parasympathetic? We're gonna be able to tell the difference from the blood work, but some other things are if you have more of a dilated pupil and 
that's where you just see a little bit of the iris color in it. That is your anabolic type or your sympathetic. Okay. Also, increased heart rate or inhibited pancreatic secretions will also be your sympathetic indicators. Okay. Your parasympathetic are the really tiny, tight, constrictive pupil. Mm -hmm. You know, even when they're in um, a little bit dimmer light, it will still be a smaller pupil. And it also is a decreased heart rate and increased digestive secretions. So they tend to break their food down pretty fast. In other words, that catabolic process of breaking down the food right is enhanced with the parasympathetic, but it's inhibited with uh, the uh, sympathetic. Right. Okay. And the body speeds up a little bit, generally, because it's more active or, or stress mode when in the anabolic uh, sympathetic state, and it's a little more relaxed, right? In the, a little bit more sluggish. A little more yeah, sluggish. In the okay. State. Now, how does that affect pH? Okay. Your anabolic or your sympathetic tends to run a little bit more acid have issues with dealing with acid, then your parasympathetic or your catabolic can actually run a little bit more alkaline. Okay, so in other words, I can, if people are doing like pH testing, they'll tend to test more acid just simply from being stressed, right? From right. having an excess sympathetic. But people who are more parasympathetic dominant will tend to test more alkaline. Usually. Yeah, okay. Usually. It's usually a, a good ground rule. I mean, there are always exceptions, but by, by using that, you can help them determine which foods and supplements that are going to work best to help bring them to balance, because that's the goal, is to get to the balance between the two. Okay, so how do we use the blood work to figure this out? Okay, you're going to see on your slide, this is a worksheet, and it will be in your notes. And this slide um, represents on this worksheet the Kelly norm values. And Dr. William Kelly established a chart of taking what the normal range for certain blood tests are and how they relate to sympathetic and parasympathetic. And we're going to go through those and just explain why those particular tests were chosen. And you basically fill in your worksheet. And that will tell you, according to a point scoring system on the worksheet, of whether they're more sympathetic or parasympathetic. And then when we look at that with programs, with sympathetic, we want to tend to help them build more because the body is shifting to that state for a reason. It's saying, OK, I'm in an anabolic state of trying to rebuild something here. So we put more building herbs and supplements in to help it out. Uh -huh. And then when we get the point systems tallied up and it says that they have more points on the parasympathetic side, then that means their body says, oh, I've got some toxins going on over here. I've shifted to a state of catabolic. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to cleanse excess toxins out. So we're going to put some more cleansing herbs in to help the body do what it's already trying to do by itself. So we're just sending in support troops based on where they are. Okay, and so this worksheet is then filled out with this table that you mm -hmm. look at these specific blood tests and depending on where the values run, you the person is then um, get so many points for each of the tests, like you know right. metabolic type one or metabolic type two or so forth. Right. Okay, we're very good. Fill that in. All right, so let's go through the blood tests that are used okay. to determine metabolic type and talk about each one individually. These blood tests were determined by Dr. Kelly as the baseline for determining sympathetic and parasympathetic because of what these tests tell us, okay? So the first one, if you'll look, is carbon dioxide, or CO2, okay. okay? This is actually an indirect measurement of the bicarbonate ion, and a bicarbonate ion is part of our buffering system to buffer our cellular acids. It's the acids. alkaline buffer. Right, it's okay. the alkaline buffer, okay? So when it's high, then the blood is actually just a little bit more alkaline and it kind of favors the parasympathetic nervous system. And that was the parasympathetic we said went a little bit more alkaline. Okay. okay. It also indicates a little bit slower rate of cellular metabolism. So the cells aren't quite sending out the toxic waste like they need to and they're not quite taking the nutrients in like they should. So it's just a little bit slower reaction. Okay. And then the cellular acid waste kind of goes up. Okay. Okay. Inside the cell, not inside in the, the cell. Okay, right. not in the fluid. Okay. So then, um, on the other hand, with that, when the bicarbonate ion, okay, when that content's low, the blood gets a little bit more acid, and uh -huh. we know that the blood doesn't shift more than like a hundredth of a point, but it does go just a little bit more acid. Uh huh. Okay, and that's with the sympathetic. Okay. And the sympathetics tend to, like we said, run a little bit more acid. So. That can be endocrine stimulation of the pituitary, um, thyroid, adrenals, and those are all 
part of the endocrine system that the sympathetics seem to struggle with, okay, with the adrenals. Um, so it increases metabolism and the cellular waste as well. Okay. okay. So what's our next blood, blood test? Okay, the next one is calcium. Okay. And calcium tends to, and we're talking about calcium as calcium in the blood. In the blood. Calcium in okay. the blood. Okay, calcium levels in the blood. We're not, not in the talking tissue. tissue, bone density, anything. It's in the blood, okay. Now this is this is standard blood tests. These are standard blood tests. This is, yeah. this is coming from standard blood tests. It just gives you a little bit um, more information what to actually do with all those numbers when they hand them to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when the calcium runs low, okay, in the sympathetic. In the, so, in the in blood. The blood. Okay. okay, so when the calcium's low in the sympathetics, <laughs> because large amounts of the calcium are needed for the nerves and the muscles. So the sympathetics go acid, okay, then what happens is the body tends to leach that calcium out of the bone to help buffer the blood because the nerves and the tissues, okay, and the muscles are requiring more calcium. Yeah, so in other words, in the sympathetic, because that's like when you do the flight fight response, right. your muscles are geared up for action, so they need more calcium, more calcium is then pulled into the muscle tissue, right. so the blood level goes down. Right. Okay, which makes okay. things more, okay. And it, it has to get the calcium from somewhere. Okay. Okay, so it'll either pull it from the bones or you have to put calcium supplements in. Okay. Okay, then um, in the parasympathetic type though, the calcium actually shifts um, from the tissues to the extracellular fluid, so the calcium levels in the blood um, go a little bit higher. Making it more alkaline. Making it more alkaline, exactly. Okay. okay. So parasympathetics don't tend to require more calcium as they already have. have an excess, but they're still leaching it out, so you have to find a way to get the body to just hold on to a little bit more of it. Okay. Okay, the next test we have is phosphorus. And that's pretty much your intestinal pH indicator of what's going on with the intestinal system. And it's kind of just like the opposite of calcium. Um, the parathyroid hormones control it and they can raise or lower phosphorus in the so body. So if it's the opposite of calcium, then calcium is gonna run high in the sympathetic and low in the parasympathetic. Exactly. Okay. Okay. All right, and then also um, sympathetic types are more prone to bone spurs um, just because of that depositing of the calcium too. Okay, calcium phosphate? Right. Okay. And then um, as the calcium gets higher in the parasympathetic, then you see the drop in the phosphorus levels and then the calcium is drawn back into the cell, then the phosphorus will rise. Okay, so they're kind of like on a teeter-totter. It's like on a teeter-totter, exactly. Right, and, and that's all controlled by the parathyroid all controlled by the hormone. parathyroid. Okay, so if that's really out of balance in your parathyroid right, or hormones. you don't have it, if you've had it removed. Oh, yeah, You're okay. going to struggle with that constantly. So it's really, really important if you've had thyroid removed and parathyroids removed to really maintain watching your acid alkaline levels. Okay. So that you know how you're metabolizing things. Very good. Okay, okay. what's the next one? The next one's cholesterol, and everybody knows this pretty much correlates with liver function. It runs high in the parasympathetic. That's just a given. And when we talk about high, okay, Let's just clarify this, that 225 is your normal cholesterol. That's oh, you mean exactly 225 isn't high? No. I thought that was high. I thought you were supposed to take drugs to um, reduce that down to like 150 or... I think the people telling you to take <laughs> drugs are taking drugs. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, cholesterol is a medically induced disease. So anything under 200 um, is starting to get in lower ranges. So. It's 175 to 275 for nutritional parameters is what your cholesterol, for cholesterol should be. So 225 is like your midpoint of that. So, so if I go in and my cholesterol measures 225 or maybe even 250, I shouldn't like panic? I'm not on the edge of having a heart attack? It means your liver's still working. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. But that just does, it normally runs higher in the parasympathetic okay. anyway. And when we say higher, you know, it, it's hitting on the upper end of that scale of the 275, 250, okay. 275, okay. Um, we're gonna go through seven different metabolic types and type seven is the one that's really prone to sluggish liver function that struggles the most with trying to regulate cholesterol and we'll get into some things that we can do for that particular type. Um, cholesterol also tends to run low in your sympathetic dominant types and that's just as detrimental as cholesterol running high because when cholesterol runs low, you have to remember cholesterol is responsible for combustion of hormones, um, for lipids firing in the cells, for cellular energy things. For um, making adrenal hormones. Making adrenal hormones. So um, running low can be 
just as bad because then you're going to start running into hormonal issues. Your reproductive hormone. I've, I've seen women who calcium levels get too low and they become infertile. Cholesterol and, levels get too I mean, low. Yeah, cholesterol yes. levels get too, uh -huh. yeah, too low and they become infertile, yes. Right. Okay, and then triglycerides. This is kind of another hot topic on blood tests. Is, oh, what's your, <laughs> what's your cholesterol and triglyceride levels? Well, now we're going to actually find out what you can do with them, what they mean. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, tri triglycerides are actually your carbohydrate and fatty acid indicator. A lot of times when you're consuming too many carbohydrates, shopping those inner aisles of the grocery store and eating refined foods, your triglycerides are going to raise. Oh, you mean if I go on a low-fat diet, low-fat, high-carb diet, I could get my triglycerides up? Yeah, they'd be way up. I thought that was supposed to lower it. <laughs> We're just being facetious, of course. <laughs> no, we know, we, we know that, the, um, that since the introduction of the low-fat, high-carb diet, that all these problems have actually gotten worse. Well, and wheat, wheat like um, whole wheat flour, because the enzyme that actually helps to break down the gluten and it's been removed. So unless you're doing sprouted <coughs> grains, you're going to have a propensity to elevate triglyceride levels. Okay. okay. It runs higher in parasympathetics, okay, and it increases energy production and um, adrenal excess in those parasympathetics. It's lower in um, lower to pancreatic enzymes and fatty acids because they're they're being oxidized, not being oxidized. So you've got like this waste situation that's going on. Like here are all these triglycerides, which actually go into the mitochondria of the cell and combust to create energy, and it requires that energy within the cell to say, okay, I'm kicking the toxins out because now I've got like that. Thing, I've, got, I've hit the button to flush them down the garbage okay. chute. In other words, the triglycerides are burned or oxidized in the cell. So if triglycerides are high, then there's an in con inefficient combustion. Right. They combust within the mitochondria of the cell, which produces energy for the cell to flush toxins. So it turns into a swamp situation when the triglycerides are high in the blood because it's saying that they're not getting in through the matrix or the interstitial tissue of combusting in the cell. Okay. Get it. Okay. So that means that you've got lowered pancreatic enzyme activity as well because they're not breaking things down. So Okay. Okay, that compromises the digestive system as well. Triglycerides run lower in sympathetics and that's that sluggish energy, adrenal exhaustion. Okay. It just they are not combusting and not getting any energy because there's nothing going in. So there's not enough triglycerides. Okay. Okay. And then they tend to, because that happens, they get that glycogen stores from the pancreas sent over and it gets bound in the liver. So you get congestion or fatty congestion in the liver. Okay. So that's that, where you have to build the blood in the liver. All right. Okay. Next one, sodium and potassium. And those are kind of like the the uh, calcium and the phosphorus on the teeter-totter. You got sodium and potassium on the teeter-totter as well. They yeah. kind of run in conjunction with each other. Potassium is concentrated inside the cells and sodium outside the cells. Okay, and they help to regulate fluid balance in the right. body, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, they bring nutrients to the cell and they're also good um, kidney function indicators of how the kidney's working or how, how it's out of balance or in balance, okay? Potassium attaches to the nutrients on the cell and it, and it eliminates those excess tissue fluids. So it helps pull nutrients in the cell and, and eliminate waste from the cell? Right. Okay. Okay. So parasympathetics tend to run higher in potassium and lower in sodium. Okay. And then your sympathetics run higher in sodium and lower in potassium. Okay. So these are just some indicators of how you're going to determine what metabolic type they are. All right. Okay. Chlorides, those are actually involved in fluid gas exchange okay. okay, within the blood, and it follows sodium. It's a, like a little piggyback thing to sodium because sodium is like this positive charge, and then um, the chloride's like this negative, so it's like when you put two magnets sodium chloride. together. Sodium chloride. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so when sodium moves into the cell, then chloride follows. Like okay. it just piggybacks on it to maintain this electromagnetic balance within the cell. Okay. And that's uh, like your electrons and your cycles and everything it keeps everything like your whole little powerhouse, your little energy center of the cell flowing smoothly. Good. Okay. They also, they run higher in um, sympathetics and lower in parasympathetics. Okay. So glucose, that's... Glucose is um, in here as part of the test. 
Glucose really isn't a standalone test as far as blood work is concerned in determining nutrient values and metabolic typing or other stuff. Um, glucose can fluctuate so rapidly, it takes a lot of other blood tests to really look at what's going on with the liver and the pancreas. So this is not as important in determining the metabolic type then? It's important in determining the metabolic type, it's just not, um, just like cholesterol, a lot of the medical oh, professionals the medical take people pull cholesterol out as a single test and say because your cholesterol is high, you know, you're going to go on meds. And then with glucose, because your glucose is high, you know, you're going to go on oh, insulin. You're, you're diabetic. They're not really standalone tests. They, okay. they really require other tests to determine if the body truly is out of balance or it's reacting to a glass of juice you had right before you went in for your blood test. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it takes other factors to determine if there's been, you know, a, a long-term or um, genetic propensity to something like that. So okay. glucose just measures carbohydrate metabolism. It's higher in sympathetics and lower in parasympathetics. Also with glucose, the insulin production is activated by the parasympathetic and that decreases the glucose levels. Okay. Okay. So the parasympathetic is also a, stimulates those pancreatic secretions, including insulin. Right, and we talked about that in the beginning, yeah. how that the digestive enzymes and pancreatic secretions were stimulated also in that catabolic response. Okay. Okay. Um, the parasympathetic also has rapid carbohydrate metabolism, okay, and they're more prone to hypoglycemia because of this. So they really should avoid the refined foods and refined sugars. So okay. their blood sugar tends to bottom out and they get that dizzy, shaky feeling. All right. What about the sympathetics? Sympathetics run higher, so their blood sugar levels are more prone to the hyperinsulemia or going into like a syndrome X type 2 diabetes. So really your sympathetics have to pay closer attention to their glucose levels. Okay, good. Okay, then we get to um, what's called a CBC on your blood work um, and the red blood cell count would be on that and we want to look at red blood cell count. That's just your oxygen carrying capacity. It runs higher in your parasympathetics and that's due to its effect on bone marrow, the liver, the spleen. So the parasympathetics are carrying then more oxygen probably yes. because they tend to have a higher red blood cell count. That also increases their metabolism. Increase their metabolism. They carry more oxygen and usually have more efficient delivery of iron and nutrients in the body as well. Okay. okay. It's lower in the sympathetic types. Um, also, the red blood cells tend to be elevated during toxic reactions. And we talked about parasympathetics. What are they doing? Their body has been sent over. It's been shifted because they're trying to cleanse. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah. So, so, so in other toxic. words, when that's the, the parasympathetic mode is also an indication that the body is in a toxic it's condition. It's in a toxic and reaction. And is trying to increase the catabolic activity to flush toxins. Right. And your red blood cells are an indicator now, of this because when they're high, then it's usually an indication well, they're more toxic. This kind of goes into that thing that you can't cleanse and build at the same time, which is something I've taught for years. Because how are you supposed to activate both the sympathetic and parasympathetic simultaneously right. or, or, or get into these op opposing modes? Your body alternates between them naturally over the course of a day, but when you're, you're toxic, you actually want to favor the parasympathetic mode because you, you want to flush toxins. When you need to build, you want to favor the sympathetic right. mode. You want to assist the body in the direction that's already started because your body knows best. It has this innate ability to figure out what's going on and how to fix it and correct it to bring it back to balance, but sometimes we don't always give it the tools to do that. So. We're going to put some supplements in saying, okay, hello, welcome, I recognize you're cleansing, so I'm going to give you a little kickstart here. Okay. And if, you know, okay, I understand that you're under some stress, so we're going to build, and I'm going to give you some more stuff to build. And that's what the blood tests really help determine is whether you should build or cleanse with the metabolic typing part of the test. There are other parts of the blood test that can tell you organ weaknesses. Um, your top 10 organs and glands that are out of balance. Um, and this gives you more nutritional profile. The other is um, the biochemical blood class. It's also offered by us at Tree of Light. Okay, great. Okay. Um, also with the red blood cell count, they are decreased during infections, anemia, blood loss. So if they're decreased in an anabolic state or sympathetic state, it's saying that, okay, something's going on here. I'm trying to rebuild or fight off. So it's something to look at. Okay. okay, then we have the white blood cell count, and that just runs lower in the parasympathetics, 
okay, and then higher in sympathetics. It runs high due to increased immune function, okay, and then digestive capabilities. Okay. The sympathetic type um, is a little bit more susceptible to bacteria infections because their immune system's always getting hit pretty hard when it's in that building phase. All right. So just helping them out and keeping it built up. The white blood cell counts always increase during infections and it's always decreased in toxic reactions. So again, it's decreased in the parasympathetic here, which is another indicator that they're trying to flush excess So toxins. this would tell you if you were, you were looking at this, um, if the body is in some kind of a, a cleansing or, or it's trying to get rid of something, right. whether it's trying to fight off an infection or it's trying to fight off some kind of a toxin that toxins, it's been exposed to. Toxins, because the immune system treats toxins as non-self as well as any bacteria coming in. So how do you know which one you're dealing with? Yeah. Are you dealing with infection? Are you dealing with toxin? And this is your indicator. Yeah, because the immune system is not just involved in fighting off microorganisms. It's also involved in fighting off toxic substances. Right, allergens. Yes. Anything okay. that's not self. Right. Okay, the next test um, we're going to look at is it's called eosinophils, and this is basically just another factor of the white blood cells. And it's an indicative of allergic reactions of the gut membranes. So this is kind of your food allergy indicator of how this plays out. It's usually higher in the parasympathetics because they're a little bit more involved in the process of allergic reactions. They tend to respond to allergy situations more dramatically. Okay. Then okay. it's also um, due to in inefficient adrenal medulla function in the parasympathetic type, so that reduces that adrenaline output. And then it increases that um, mast cell sensitivity, okay, and that histamine release. So Yeah, well some people may not know what that is, but the mast cells are, are cells that line the respiratory membranes and so forth, and when we have hay fever or um, allergic rhinitis or any of those sorts of things, it's due to the mast cells being hypersensitive, they burst, they release histamine, and that creates your typical hay fever, runny nose, drippy congestion, mm -hmm. wheezing, so forth, symptoms. Then we can also look at with the eosinophils of whether they're in a toxic or a infectious phase too because it's, it's increased in allergic reactions, but it's also increased in parasitical infections. Ah. So this is a real good parasite indicator, and I usually always see this one high in fibromyalgia people. That's interesting. So that's just some, some stuff I've been keeping track of. Well, parasites um, can be very difficult to diagnose, so if this would make, be a good clue as to the possibility then mm -hmm. that were parasites present. And then it's decreased in the toxic reactions, and also the infections decrease it as well. So it's um, wow. kind well, of a split. Then right there, there you have uh, the information that you need to determine if it's an infection, allergy, or toxin. Right. That's uh, throwing your immune system off. Right. So or even, even the possibility of parasites. That's great. Okay. Okay. We're going to look um, a little bit closer. We're going to discuss seven types. And again, th these are some general categories that you can plug your clients into after you have their blood work to fill out this little sheet, this little worksheet, and it's very simple to do. Do it on yourself um, to help you get your own food program going. We're gonna discuss the seven types, okay? And we're gonna discuss the sympathetic metabolizers first, and that was the one that had a little bit of the decreased um, digestive function, and they're usually in that anabolic or that building mode because they've got a weakened condition. And they, usually do better being vegetarian types. Um, increasing vegetables and eliminating um, animal proteins will help them build much quicker and much more efficiently. Now, the, those numbers are one, four, and six, which we're gonna discuss individually in just a few minutes. Six is the most um, inefficient of these types. It is the weakest. If you look out of one, four, and six as one being the strongest, Four is kind of the midpoint, and six is the weakest of these types when we get to those. These people require an alkalizing diet. They're usually running pretty high in the acid, and they need a little bit higher potassium. Okay. Okay. Next one, um, we're also going to look at some factors with it that proteins if they're going to be doing any animal proteins at all, which I usually don't recommend, especially if it's a metabolic type six, because that is the weakest. But metabolic type one of that doing proteins, it should essentially come from things like fish or chicken, 
but vegetable sources would really be the best, like with your soy sources, your spirulina sources, things like that. They do well with fruits, so fruits and juicing, and vegetable juicing, fruit juicing, like juicing organic fruits and vegetables can really help with that process of rebuilding because they're so high in enzymes and rich in nutrients, and they're live foods and raw foods, okay? Whole grains, as long as they're sprouted, we talked about that a little bit earlier, how it doesn't contain the enzyme to break it down. Okay, um, enzymes are a must for this one, four, and six type. They're a must for everyone, but they're especially a high <laughs> level of consideration for this type, for the sympathetic. Okay. Okay, let's look at some things. Um, just in general, I'd like to cover some general supplementation of what it takes to help the sympathetic type rebuild so that they can start bringing themselves back to balance. Okay, let's look at that. Okay. First one, um, amino acids. When they're reducing proteins, especially animal proteins, they may not be getting enough amino acids, and we all know that there are 22 amino acids and they're totally essential as the building blocks for any type of repair or rebuilding that goes on in the body. So they also um, are synthesizers of protein. So it can help break down some of the toxins in the body, the conversion. Okay. okay. Vitamin C. Um, vitamin C actually helps the immune system because it burns off like this garbage, this little debris that's going on within the cellular level to help the body get rid of it a lot easier. Then we have biotin, and that helps with the oxidation of fatty acids. So it assists in breaking those down, um, helping to get some, the good fats broken down and out and taking in the essential fats for brain function, nerve function, okay, feeding the, the body. Chromium, everybody hears a chromium, okay? There are six different types of chromium and one of those even removes rust from pipes, so I don't think we wanna take that one. <laughs> <laughs> chromium nicotinate or your glucose tolerance formula, GTF chromium is the best choice for the sympathetic because the picolinates are too heating and we don't need too heating because we're trying to build, we're trying to soothe their system. So chromium um, GTF stimulates enzymes involved in glucose metabolism, so it helps assist the pancreas, helps to keep their carbohydrate metabolism and balance, and we all know that it like reduces sugar cravings is what it's pretty well known for. Okay, and then folic acid, that's your um, B9, and that's a coenzyme utilization in protein. So it, it helps to activate with protein to deposit where it needs to go and break it down. And then also folic acid helps with blood conditions as well, whether it's too thin or too thick, and it helps to bring balance to that. Okay. We got some more on here. Uh, magnesium regulates your acid alkaline balance. We know calcium contracts, magnesium relaxes, okay? And your sympathetics tend to get a little bit uptight tenser, and tense, yes. right? Because we talked about how that calcium is being used for that nerve and muscle tissue before. Yes. So magnesium helps to regulate that and helps to soothe. They're usually, because they, through the type um, with your sympathetics, feel like they've eaten a meal and four hours later, it still feels like it's there. It's sitting just like a sits brick. sits like a brick on their stomach because they don't adjust very well. Right. So right. hydrochloric acid production is usually low or minimal in the sympathetic types, again, which were your types one, four, and six. So the hydrochloric <coughs> acid enhances hydrochloric acid production within the stomach. Niacin, we, we've all done that. <laughs> niacin flush. <laughs> Uh, niacin improves circulation and it reduces cholesterol levels. Um, it can take smaller amounts of niacin, as small as like 250 milligrams to increase circulation, which helps them to deliver, to, um, deliver nutrients where it needs to be in the sympathetics. However, in order to reduce cholesterol levels with niacin, you have to get up to such a high milligram content that um, we'll probably see you smoking <laughs> across the horizon. You'll be on fire. It's um, about 5,000 milligrams to really make a difference in cholesterol. So um, the niacin that's in the hops and fever few base is non-flushing, but yet you're still getting niacin instead of niacinamide, um, which is synthesized. So that, that really helps, and you can gradually increase that program that you keep adding 250 milligrams a week, kind of like we've discussed on some earlier videos about the Mega Kel program, 
and you add 250 a week until you get to your max and then you leave that max there for um, one month um, anywhere from three to four weeks and then you can start decreasing it again and that really efficiently helps to activate how your body utilizes and burns and, and stores cholesterol. Okay, uh, PABA, paraminobenzoic acid, stimulates intestinal bacteria and it stimulates the good bacteria so that it will flush the bad bacteria out. So it works really well. It's usually in a, with a lot of your B complexes, they'll put it in, the, the PABA in there. And this helps them um, when you do it along with bifidophilus. And we also have pancreatic enzymes and those are available um, in the food enzymes and they enhance enzymatic activity and they enhance the enzymatic activity with its interaction with food not taken on an empty stomach because you, um, the ones with hydrochloric acid in it unless you just do it for purely entertainment you don't want to take hydrochloric acid on an empty stomach <laughs> it's no fun okay um, we look at the next set Okay, we have potassium also on this list and potassium alkalizes. Potassium normalizes heartbeat, so um, tachycardia, things like that sometimes can be really, really helped with potassium. And of course it helps pull those toxins out of the cell and right. helps the kidneys flush the toxins out of the body. So the blood's not having to handle so many back right. to the heart. Okay. Then we have vitamin B1, 2, and 6, and all of those, those three, aid in carbohydrate metabolism. And I don't think a lot of people realize how important bees are in that aspect of what they do to carbohydrates. So well, you know, that's part important. of the problem of eating refined carbohydrates is you don't get all of the bees and things you need to metabolize them properly. So you wind up depleting your stores of those vitamins. Right. It's one of the things that's so bad about refined sugar and white flour and everything. Even though they put a few of the bees back in, it's really not the same they're as... They're still negated by the <laughs> they're, they're still not... Um, not near what there is. I mean, all the, all the bees in the sugar get all, drawn off in the molasses. Right. <laughs> so you got to add bees. That's just another yes. given. <laughs> then vitamin D helps with your calcium utilization. Vitamin K helps um, with blood clotting process. And the blood clotting process is actually far more important than I think a lot of people realize. We're all trying to thin our blood. We're all trying to keep clotting from happening. Yes, in certain aspects, but you have to remember that when the blood gets sticky um, in some form of clotting process that the red blood cells are agglutinating, it's an immune response as well because what they're doing is they're sticking together and they're surrounding the toxin, like the yeast colonies and things like that, so that they don't have to be processed through the cell and then flushed back out and sent back to the liver and back through the colon and recirculated. So it's the body's mechanism as a, a defense system. It's Helps trying to, to um, surround isolate it, the... to isolate the invader. Yes. So sometimes blood clotting in that aspect is essential. Okay, I can see that for sure. Okay, then we have zinc. And zinc helps with the absorption of other vitamins, and especially it helps with B complex. The utilization of letting the body know what to do with the B. It's like a tagging system. It's saying, okay, you're gonna go here, you're gonna go here, this is your job, okay? This is where you're supposed to be. And it's like a, a little gift wrap center, you know, and you get your name tag put on your gift. <laughs> That's kind of what the zinc helps to do. Uh -huh. Manganese, um, which you can find, it's really high in red raspberry. Okay. Yes. And it's a catalyst in the synthesis of fatty acids and cholesterol. So you can actually use manganese to help with cholesterol levels too. I didn't know that. That's a new piece of information for me. Yeah, red raspberry. So red raspberry. <laughs> and I would think help. that's really. Um, I'm not sure um, if the faux tea or the hoshu wu is high in manganese. I would. I would like to check that because I feel pretty sure that that's how it works too, because it helps as a catalyst to the fatty acids and cholesterol. Wonderful. Okay, panathenic acid, which is your B5, and that helps stimulate adrenal function and helps with those sympathetic types that are uptight and stressed out, and when they're stressed out, it raises their acid level. Okay, also inositol and choline, and um, those, again, are usually sometimes in with the B complexes or they're in with the lecithin, and they increase the acidity, but um, they should be avoided by your, your sympathetics, okay? and then your lecithin can increase, increase acidity. So 
Those are avoids for the sympathetic. Those are avoids. Okay, uh -huh. so those last ones are yeah, the last are things two that they are, should um, things, things that they, they should, should avoid. Not use. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to go to the parasympathetic metabolizer, and we have another set of numbers for these people. Okay. And, and these it's are uh, kind of going like the other ones, one, four, and six, and now we're two, five, and seven. Right. So they were, they have the. Uh, 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 did, do you know why Dr. Kelly wrote them this way? Is it kind of? We'd have to ask Dr. Kelly. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting <laughs> way he wrote that. Just following how he did it. I know. <laughs> um, I was kind of curious as to why he why he didn't just label label the sympathetics one two three and the other ones four five six. So we'd have to ask him. I guess so. He wanted to just make it complicated. <laughs> okay. Your parasympathetic metabolizers are more of your um, carnivorous type. It's probably why they have incisors. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and it's types two, five, and seven. Okay, so two being the strongest of this, five being in the middle, and then seven being the weakest that needed the most supplemental support. Okay. You notice we haven't talked about three in here yet because three is in the middle, it's balanced. All right. And you get so few of them anyway. <laughs> okay. Oh, you mean there aren't that many balanced people in our society? You're striving to achieve for that, but okay. just uh, it's hard sometimes. Okay, so these people need more protein. Okay. And they run a little bit more alkaline, like we said, so it's okay to have a little bit more of the acid from the protein. Okay. All right. Let's look. Um, some things that they can do are the red meat, and um, that can be eaten more frequently. And again, vitalized meat, okay, meaning organic, no steroids, no hormones. Not um, cooked to death. Not cooked to death. The more you cook an animal protein, the more it becomes a carcinogen. It becomes detrimental. So the rarer, the better. And it's, you just can't take the chance of eating most of the meat rare. So that's why you have to really do the organic and sear it on high heat on the outside to kill off those bacteria. Okay. Okay, um, the root starchy vegetables are, are usually fairly good for this, for the parasympathetic type. The leafy green vegetables, just simply because they tend to run a little bit alkaline, can actually push them too far alkaline. And when they get a little bit too far alkaline, they're having a harder time enzymatically breaking stuff down. So if they do have any of the leafy greens, they really need to make sure they're raw and not like your cooked spinach would be absolutely the worst choice. Oh, okay. okay. And the yeah. cooked greens could be, you know, not so good choices for parasympathetic. So it, as long as it's Ron has enzymes in it, it can help. But really your root and starchy vegetables are going to be better for them. Uh-huh. Okay. Also, um, they do well with whole grains and legumes. So those are something to consider. And slow cooked on the legumes, the better. And then again, we talked about whole grains as being spout, sprouted grains. Okay. Fruit. For the parasympathetic metabolizers, because their blood sugars tend to bottom out really quickly, they burn the, pretty rapidly, the sugar. So fruit should actually be reduced to like snacks only. These are not the type of people that should sit down in the morning and do a huge fruit plate and be done with it because in an hour or two, their blood sugar is just going to bottom out. <laughs> so protein is going to be a better choice. They'll burn it up them. too fast. Yes, they burn it because... What are your parasympathetics? They're catabolic, so they're they burning, they're breaking down. Break the food down, down faster, and right. they, they burn it up faster. Right. Whereas the um, the sympathetic might do well with the fruit plate because the sympathetic would do well because, yeah, because the heavy clean, protein yes. would just sit on their stomach and forever right. not break down well. Okay. okay. This type, the parasympathetic type, usually craves and does well with like heavier type foods, the cream and the butter and cultured dairy. Um, I'm not a big proponent of dairy. I'm just following what Dr. Kelly wrote up with a lot of this. So I tend to recommend an organic yogurt when it when it says dairy products. Okay. Because I am not I'm in not favor a of fond cheese of <laughs> or, or milk of any kind. I, now, I like I like uh, cheese and stuff, but I know it's not that good for you. The lighter the cheese are the harder than the higher enzymatic value you have. And there are some cheeses that could be neutral, but yogurt's usually your best choice, and especially yes. because of the active cultures in it. Right. Okay, um, also these people should eat enough, the parasympathetic metabolizers should eat enough in the evening to carry them through the night. Now, um, a lot of times with food combining and a lot of other nutrition stuff you'll read, it says don't have any protein after 2 p.m. That is true for the sympathetic types. 
and that works much better for their system. But your dominant parasympathetic, you would want them to have like that late protein snack because it's going to help them get through with the blood sugar things in the evening, like nut butters. Nut butters are probably the best choice to do just a small, I mean, we're talking small portions. It's not sitting down and having a huge have meal. A, have a, a teaspoon, a couple of teaspoons of it. Right. Like, so that they have a little protein to carry them through the night. Otherwise, their blood sugar can bottom out while they're sleeping, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that can cause someone to wake up in the middle of the night frequently, too, if your blood sugar is bottoming out. Also yeah, and in it children. interrupts your, your rest and your sleep pattern, so it mm -hmm. sends them back into more of a catabolic process that during sleep repair rebuild time, they're shifting back into catabolic of breaking down, so they start losing vital energy because they're in a constant breakdown mode. And that can also be a cause of bedwetting in children, is the low blood sugar, not ha and, and sometimes having just a little protein snack at bedtime will resolve that for Good. some children. Good. Yes. Okay, so let's look at um, some supplementation for the parasympathetics. Okay. Okay, bioflavonoids. It helps with the absorption and utilization of vitamin C. However, it's not an acid source. Okay, it's like a buffered C or an ester C. So, bioflavonoid, like yours, such as bioflavonoids, would be a better choice for your parasympathetics. Okay. Okay, we have uh, magnesium, phosphorus, vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin D. All of these maintain calcium levels, and they also help with the utilization of calcium. So your parasympathetics, the calcium was running a little bit higher in the blood. Okay. Okay. Um, your calcium scorbate, that's your acid alkaline balance. So that helps bring them to a, a balance point. Sodium ascorbate is, it helps with the sodium potassium exchange and we've talked about that with the fluids and the toxins in and out, that sodium potassium pump that a lot of people hear about. Okay, inositol and choline are actually recommended for this type where they were avoid for the other type. And that means that it utilizes those um, fats and cholesterol. So the cholesterol um, helps with the hormonal release, and um, then the fats get stored. They help with the nervous system. Okay, um, niacinamide is recommended here for circulation and blood vessel integrity um, without the flush effect because most of your parasympathetics can run in a little bit heated category because when catabolic activity or breaking down and cleansing activity is going on in the body, it tends to make the body heat up. So you can tell like um, when you get a massage and you get really ischemic or the red comes to the back, you know that you're releasing toxins so it gets that heat going on to like with a fever even, you know, the cells yeah. speed up the friction to flush the toxins out. So your parasympathetics can get, be a little bit more heated. And I think that's why he recommends an isinamide here. I still just preferably just use a total B complex for this. Okay. Okay, um, panathenic acid, we're back again to that is the B5 still um, stimulates the adrenals and helps with cellular metabolism with the parasympathetics. Phosphorus helps um, with utilization of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And it also helps to um, repair cells, and it also helps with energy production. Okay, so um, RNA strengthens the cell walls and intracellular material to help them because they're constantly in that breakdown mode. Okay. Okay, vitamin A helps with growth and repair of tissue. Vitamin E increases oxygen to the heart. Mm -hmm. And then B12 stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. So it actually helps to balance them out. Okay. So, and if they're getting raw, rare, <laughs> I guess we don't eat raw, but rare red meat that has the B12 in it that they can convert. And then we have, you know, the liquid B12 that you can just take as a supplement. Okay. That helps um, increase metabolic activity of um, neurological tissue as well. So it'll help soothe the whole nervous system. Okay. B15, which kind of interesting, we really don't get to have that in the United States, <laughs> but the pentagamic acid, and it's an, it helps with the oxidative process of cell respiration and glucose oxidation, and um, they use it in a, a lot of other countries, like for, instead of insulin, to help oh, yeah? to work with <laughs> insulin factors, so um, B complex we have, <laughs> All right. and um, some, of our own, some of our own bees are produced in the gut anyway, so Keeping the intestinal flora healthy and putting the bifidophilus in would help help with us holding on to our bees. Okay, um, zinc for vitamin absorption and it improves the pancreatic insulin function. 
Okay. So it helps with our, our pancreas to produce the enzymes needed. All right. Okay. Okay. This is just a little chart. Um, you will have this in your notes telling you the different types and just whether they have um, more of a vegetarian or um, an omnivore or a carnivorous tendency, what would work best for them. So you okay. can refer to that. And then we have um, the seven types to just cover a little bit, some, okay. some tendencies Okay, so let's, let's look them. at each one of these. So the metabolic type one is, is this the, um, the stronger of the... Uh, um, Vegetarian? This is a stronger of your sympathetic group, which is your vegetarian group. The ones that do better, better on more uh -huh. plant foods and less animal foods. Less animal protein. And, okay. And they still need protein, but it would just be from a plant-derived source would be the best choice. Um, again, we talked about the fishes and the poultry would work. But one is the most durable of that group. Okay. So it's the least out of balance. Okay. I got it. Okay. So one... They burn sugar more slowly. Okay. So that's why they can tolerate fruit and juices and stuff like that so well. Right. They, they burn everything slower. Okay. Okay. But that also sets like this, the sympathetic type up more for your hyperinsulinemia, your precursor to your type 2 diabetes as well. So they have to be really careful with the refined sugars. Yes, which would which, which jack the sugar way up and then it comes plummeting down. So in this case, we're talking about complex carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates, even mm -hmm. some of your um, high glycemic index yeah. would be okay for right. them. Okay. okay. Which is what well, your fruits are. Well, fructose doesn't jack the blood sugar up quite as high, so the, the sugars in the fruits don't immediately metabolize into uh, glucose. Right. The, the it burns a little slower through the liver. Okay. So they do really well starting their day off with like a big plate of, of fruit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they do really well on a raw diet because of the enzymatic factors more than anything. Okay, they're getting in the enzymes to help them break the food down that they're taking in without robbing or using up enzyme stores of their own. Okay, we do know that a raw diet can be cleansing as well uh -huh. um, as building. And that's simply because it's going to start flushing a little bit of the toxins out of probably what's putrefied in there before that's been sitting there, but they haven't had the enzymatic activity to break down. So enzymes are crucial, and the more they can get in in a raw foods form, it's going to help them out. Good. Okay. Um, also, important foods for them to do, and anytime whole grains are listed, it's more your sprouted grains so that they, again, have the enzyme activity. Um, this says milk and eggs, and I'm just like, again, I'm not a milk proponent. We're just putting on here what Dr. Kelly recommended and trying to stay true with that. But um, organic milk or soy milk, we can, um, soy would be a better choice here. Yeah, probably. And <laughs> eggs, as long as they're organic, uh, so that they don't have all the steroids and antibiotics and hormones in them. Then your nuts and seeds and rice, and of course, choosing like um, brown rice. Some of right. your wild grain rices and not white rice. Yes. <laughs> I'm telling you, I could spend hours like reading labels. I, I want to go back to my theory of ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Actually, you know, the, the, it's just nutrition is so important. A lot of times people think they can do it with just supplements. But they really do need to find the diet that's optimum for their particular type, and that's not going to be the same for everyone. I mean, it's not, and that's why I've this seen, is so important because it's based on their own specific body chemistry. Yeah, because I've seen people who um, tried to do the raw food diet and it just wasn't right for their type, and it just they screwed them up. They weren't mentally and emotionally stable. They didn't have any energy, and yet you see other people who who go on that kind of a diet, and they just seem to thrive on it. And this helps you figure out why. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so also um, that metabolic type 1 does really well on your fruits and vegetables, lots of them. That should be okay. the staple part of their diet. All right. Okay. Um, do you want to do type 2? Yeah, let's talk about type 2. Okay, do you want to talk about type 2? Well, the, um, the, you're the expert on this, okay. but these, <laughs> these people tend to have a Scandinavian genetic background, and they um, burn sugar um, rapidly, so they have a tendency to hypoglycemia. So the sugar burns off in their blood, they, it bottoms out. So they should avoid sugar and simple carbohydrates because that goes in, triggers insulin production, they burn it off quick, and boom, they bottom out with their sugar. So they need foods that are going to stay with them longer. So that means they're going to do well with more protein. 
so some of the foods that they um, need to use are um, like the meats, the beef, sardines, lamb, veal. So this, this type mm -hmm. can tolerate red meat, obviously. This is the omnivore. Okay. Okay. They don't truly just do well with real high amounts of protein. They need the balance between the vegetables and the protein. Okay. And but it's again, the, but again, it's the uh, low glycemic vegetables, the, right. the vegetables that are more uh, going to burn more slowly in right. the system. So that's why it says that um, they can eat only a small amount of grains, whole grains, because mm -hmm. grains um, tend to jack up the sugar level. And they do poor, poorly on um, the simple greens and fruits and sugary things. Right. So what they want is to eat more of the uh, vegetables and fruits that are starchy root vegetables that, that burn more slowly in the system. Yeah, the slower burning with these people work better okay. to balance out with the protein. Very good. Okay. Well, of course, then metabolic type 3 are the balanced metabolizers. So what, are they the lucky ones? Um, they're non-existent, so we'll go to type four. <laughs> <laughs> they're the ones that Once basically while, are their systems like running optimally. Um, they're running optimally. They're pretty much following, balancing their acid pH, their acid alkaline. They'll cycle. I mean, it's not like they're always going to be perfect. They'll cycle through their acid alkaline balance. Um, usually, if the few type threes that I have, I just tell them to keep doing what you're doing because obviously it's working. <laughs> All right. Well, and good. Then, you know, trying to achieve that optimal balance of shifting some of the other types to that point, you'll get some people that will hit that point and stay there for a few weeks, and then they might go back to their diet habits again, and it'll shift again. So they go in and out of it sometimes. Now, these four and five metabolic types that are coming up, these are more like in between the extremes. The one and the two are the, like, um, the more balanced expressions of the... Right. Uh, one... One is more of your durable, um, of your sympathetic. Two is your more durable of your parasympathetic. Now, these are getting a little bit more out of balance with the, the four right. and five. And the so higher the number goes, the further away from balance it is. Okay. So is, okay. The, is the four then is... Um, four is your sympathetic, sympathetic, okay. And the five and will be the parasympathetic right. of that same ring. Okay. So okay. this tells so. us about a little about four. Okay. So four usually... Um, they can have that Mediterranean genetic background. They should probably do about 60% raw foods diet because okay. they're, they're going to need to um, get that enzymatic activity again. They can do some protein like your fish, your chicken, your turkey, um, other fowl, M maybe some rare red beef organic once in a while. They do um, really well with just all vegetables too as long as they're getting some protein sources in there like some of your spirulinas. Um, your tofus, things like that. They can do some fruits and they can do some dairy. And again, when we say some dairy, we're talking about possibly, you know, like yogurt. A little yogurt, yeah. Okay, and then our type five. Which is the um, parasympathetic. So right. this is the one that does well with a little more protein. And, right. Okay. So they can tolerate a wide variety of foods. Uh, so they can have uh, red meat several times a week. But again, they're like their counterparts that are prone to hypoglycemia, so right. they don't want to avoid the sugar. And they do well with a diet of uh, uh, seafood. Salmon and tuna are good, mm -hmm. and some beef and some lamb. Um, again, prepared right and, and or preferably organic. Um, cheese and butter, although, like we say, we're not that big fond of not Well, not uh, processed cheeses, and again, you're higher in somatic. Feta is one that I usually recommend that's pretty neutral across the board. Are they a little more tolerant of whole grains then? They're a little bit more tolerant of whole grains, so they can actually add some whole grain cereals in. Um, a lot of vegetables and fruits again. Okay. If, you, if you've noticed, in every single one of these, the vegetables balance the whole program out. So it's right. so one thing that a lot of people don't have going on. So kind of wrapping this up, we're getting into the six and seven. And these are the ones that are way out of balance and need the most supplementation. Right. These so, are your weakest type. So six is the most imbalanced sympathetic, sympathetic type and uh -huh. seven is the most imbalanced parasympathetic type. Right. Okay. So tell us a little bit about those. Okay. Six is that really poor metabolizer. They're the ones that have that brick sitting in their stomach six hours after a meal. Okay. Um, they also don't do very well with raw foods. Raw foods seem to really upset their system because the enzymes like stir stuff up and kick them into gear too much. So they really need to do cooked food. 
So like steamed vegetables. Right. Steamed would be good, yes. Um, okay. Slow cooked, like, you know, some legumes slow cooked. Um, these these people really do require a higher amount of supplementation because they don't have the digestive system capability to utilize it out of their food and actually liquid supplementation as far as the form of liquid herbs would work much better for these people um, the they less they have to break down. down the better the faster you can get it in their system the better okay okay what, what are the foods they do well with um well, their well, thing we is to stay away bit. from whole, from all of the um, refined foods. They just it's just going to send their system into oblivion. So they do well with the fruits and the vegetables and the greens, um, things like onions, potatoes, mushrooms, radishes, the whole grains. Um, they can use honey as a sweetener really well. Nuts and seeds are a good source of protein for them um, and essential fatty acids. And they can, once they start getting their system more to balance, can do some seafood and fowl, but usually not in the beginning. Okay. So last of all is the type 7, and this is the most imbalanced um, parasympathetic. parasympathetic. Okay. Okay. So they're also inefficient metabolizers. They're inefficient metabolizers, yeah. They but need the whole natural foods as well, and they can't do any of the processor refined foods, so just like the type 6. They have to avoid all of those. Except in this type with type 7, type 6 was more of a building. Type yeah. 7 is extreme cleansing. They, these are really just toxic sewer sludge type people. Okay? <laughs> they need to get it flushed out. So um, even doing the fasting where you do the lemon juice and maple syrup fast, uh -huh. um, even with a little bit of the cayenne in it, would really be beneficial to this person to do for a couple of three days, just watching their blood sugar levels while they're doing it. They do well with some seafood, but again, after they've been balanced, they've been balanced for a little while. Um, organ meat soups, um, unprocessed, uncolored cheeses and butter. Again, the beef, lamb, veal, and wild game. Actually, wild game is the best out of that, but again, they're going to have to have enzyme supplementation to be able to break it down. So enzymes are highly, highly important for the six and the seven. Um, also, the type 7 is not going to do well with leafy green vegetables, fruits, or even your um, organic sugars, like yeah. your cane sugars or anything like that. Well, we're, while we're about out of time, we just had a couple questions. Is it possible that your metabolic type can change a little bit? Oh, your metabolic type can change because it's based on your biochemistry of your blood and your body, and you're trying to change it. You're so, trying to so shift as, it. So as you, as you improve your diet and, and supplement Absolutely. and get your organs rebuilt and stuff, you can move more towards being closer a balanced, to balance. Balanced metabolizer. Well, that's good to know. So we're not just stuck forever. Not like being... your blood type. <laughs> you're not, you're not <laughs> that's good. Well, I'm, I'm sure this information will be useful to many of these people out here, especially since um, you know people get confused about diet and nutrition a lot because um, it is a very individual thing, isn't it? It's not like it's very individual. We can, it's not like we can write up this perfect program that if we all ate broccoli twice a week and did this and did that and the other that we would all be perfectly healthy. It that varies cool. a little bit with where our, <laughs> where our body is and of course this is one way we have of determining um, where a person is so we can have a better understanding of what kind of a program to put them on. Anything? And it also gives you something to do with all of those little numbers that they hand you on your blood test that you have no clue why they put them on there. So now you can use that to determine where you are metabolically to help you make changes in your nutrition. Great. Thank you for watching.